Hello, and welcome to the IoT Chat, where we explore the latest developments in the Internet of Things. I'm your host, Christina Cardoza, Editorial Director of Insight.Tech. And today, we're going to be talking about the use of AI in the OR with Dennis Kogan from Care Syntax. But as always, before we jump into the conversation, let's get to know our guest. Hey, Dennis, thanks for joining us. Hi, Christina. Thanks for having me. What can you tell us about yourself and uh, Care Syntax before we jump into the, the topic? Well, uh, I am a tech entrepreneur first and foremost. Um, you know, I uh, started this company together with my partner Bjorn von Siemens about 10 years ago. Uh, we had a different healthcare company right before that. I'm not a physician. Uh, I'm actually uh, more of a technology guy. So I graduated from Carnegie Mellon University with an information systems background um, and then ended up working in data science consulting, doing quite a bunch of healthcare. Uh, but my link to surgery is actually more personal. My father is a surgeon, my grandfather is a surgeon, and my great-grandfather is a surgeon. So it's kind of a dynasty of urologists uh, that stop with me. But I like to think that I'm contributing to surgery in a different way, perhaps more scalable than if I were a surgeon. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you found you found sort of a back end way to get to get into the, the family uh, business, so to speak. Isn't that so interesting how it happens? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that that's really interesting that you've been in the healthcare space for so long and, you know, you have so many a deep history, family history in the healthcare space, because I'm sure you've seen this space has just, you know, evolved rapidly, especially over the last couple of years. And that's sort of where I wanted to start off the conversation. Um, you know, we've had so many technological advancements and innovations in this space what have you seen over the last couple of years and how has this advancement, how has it changed expectations that, that surgeons and physici physicians and patients have coming into, you know, quality health care? Yeah, well, you know, just kind of piggybacking on the prior question, when I was at CMU at Carnegie Mellon, I dealt a bit with like other innovations in other industries like sports analytics and security and military. And I was at the time already talking to my dad who you know, was a surgeon, I was telling him, hey, you know, like, you know, that athletes get this and this for performance management and situational awareness and get analytics and they get every decision, you know, could be supported. And he told me, you know, we have nothing like this. Yes, we have very interesting and very important medical devices and we're continuously getting clinical innovation in our hands, but there isn't really a lot of data usage and um, uh, decision-making support. Um, and I think that hasn't changed that much up until a few years ago, to, to your point. I think, you know, we had a ton of innovation around medical devices. You know, you're probably familiar, familiar with the Da Vinci robot, you know, intuitive surgical, you know, brought robotics into the space. But at the end of the day, it's still helping the surgeon operate with his or her hands. You know, the advancements that we're seeing and obviously we're part of is actually enabling the surgical teams to not only have better tools in their hands, but also have better decision support mechanisms, right? So, uh, you know, with the volume of patients, uh, you know, I think there is more and more expectation that the surgeon cannot be just thinking herself or himself about the risks of the procedure, right? They do, uh, they do want support. They do want more information to stratify risks more and doing it in their heads as it, as it happened before is probably no longer acceptable given how much background technology there is in healthcare and outside healthcare. Absolutely. And and to your point, I could see a little bit why the surgical field may be a little bit slower to adopt some of these technologies or to advance in this space, given that, um, you know, you're operating on, on people and it's, it's, you know, such a mission critical surgery or application. And some people, consumers may not feel comfortable having this technology being used in the operating room. But now we've seen just all these advancements, how it can help. And it's really providing more, you know, like you said, it's mitigating some of the risks that we did have before. Um, you know, so how how do you see now the surgical space adding some of this technology to the OR in a safe way to ensure that it, you know, it's accurate, the, the physicians are comfortable with it, but then also the patients are comfortable with it? Yeah, I mean, I think patients, um, I would say patients are probably relative to other types of therapies or chronic diseases are less aware of what's happening in the OR. Naturally, you're under anesthesia <laughs> as a patient. But what patients really do want, they want to understand how likely are they to have a good outcome. They want to understand data about their surgical teams 
so that they can really weigh their choices, right? So I think, um, and they expect, and they probably are surprised, would be surprised to to know that not as much integrated decision-making support is available to surgical teams that will be operating on them. And so I think, um, y- you know, the challenge has been, to your point, is that, you know, surgery is a real-time intervention, right? And so in order to integrate new technology and AI, any automation to be able to jog decisions, you really have to get a lot of um, new infrastructure in that would be able to pull data and, and create the necessary backbone to actually make the software and the AI run in that real-time setting. Um, and there is a pretty high threshold of quality and, and uh, kind of operational effectiveness, right? So, for example, anything that uh, is used in the operating room should have almost no lag, right? So th- these should be real-time, near real-time um, uh, decision support uh, mechanisms. And that by itself, you, you know, is a, is a higher hurdle than a lot of other information technology that's used has been used in healthcare. So I think, you know, over the last decade, I would say probably since we started, I think the biggest change that's happened in the operating room is actually, you know, bringing live all these different disparate devices into one system that is able to a drive the safer and more automated workflow in the operating room, but also be able to capture data and receive data so that you can start building even more advanced innovation around AI to really, you know, bring even more decision-making support to the surgical teams. Yeah. And that's always seemed to be a big hurdle in the healthcare space is having these silos of data. Um, You know, if patients have different data depending on the devices they're using or the doctors they're seeing or the space they're in. So, um, you know, I, I can see why it's been a little bit difficult on the physician side to be able to get access to all this data and really make those real-time in- decisions. And of course, with automation and AI, like you mentioned, it's all bringing it in one place so that they can react quicker, they can make better decisions, they can have that top of mind rather than, you know, information getting lost. Um, But when we're talking about AI in the operating room and technology advancements, I think a lot of people automatically go to what we were talking earlier about, like the robotics and robot arms and people robots being used to do the surgery. In this context, we're not necessarily talking about AI guided surgery, right? It's more AI assisted surgery where AI is providing the up to date and accurate information for the physicians to actually help surgery and improve patient outcome. Is that correct? Yeah, no, that's 100% correct. I mean, I think, you know, there isn't a very high probability of surgeons and surgical teams being replaced by technologies for a long, long, long time. (laughs) Um, The environment is extremely dynamic, um, and it's not only quantifiable, uh, you know, activities and sort of like uh, techniques, it's also communication and teamwork, right? I mean, it's, it's actually a team sport. So, you know, part of the outcome depends on you know, risk stratification, how well a surgeon does a certain maneuver. But part of it is how well does a surgeon communicate with the nursing staff and, you know, anesthesiologists and how how do they kind of adapt to changing clinical picture during the procedure. It's so complex um, that it's almost impossible to foresee how this could be replaced by artificial intelligence in foreseeable future. But, you know, because of that same dynamicism, AI, uh, you know, has a lot to give in terms of bringing the right information and options to the fingertips of physicians in this dynamic setting, right? I mean, a procedure that's lasting hours or say an hour and physician team that may be operating from early morning into late evening with very different types of patients, you could be having a healthy you know, 25-year female or a very sick 85-year-old male, right? And you have to be able to adjust a lot of inputs uh, and a lot of decisions through throughout the procedure uh, dynamically. And that cognitive overload often does cause mistakes or suboptimal decisions. So at the end of the day, you know, there is, we call this variability, you know, the change, the risk in surgery is unfortunately there. Uh, there's, you know, probably one out of uh, seven cases has some sort of significant complications, so over 15%. And so proactive risk management through situational awareness, through certain automation, 
uh, is what we're talking about. It's about re reducing and removing variability that was unwarranted, that's driven by the cognitive overload and changing clinical picture. Uh, and so I think, you know, the best use cases that we see right now for AI is really, you know, proactively managing risk by showcasing specific information about that given patient, about that procedure, before the procedure and real time and after the procedure to be able to guide the entire pathway and the outcome to be better than it would be without that support. I love all the patient examples that you provided because it really just showcases not only do physicians have a number of different things going in their heads with different patients and just different operations that they have to do throughout the day, but not every patient is a clear cut case. Not every surgery is a one surgery fits all. And there's unforeseen complications and decisions you have to make while you are performing the surgery. So I can see how AI being brought in really provides that real time information that allows them to react fast and to give that best possible outcome, surgical outcome for those patients. We were talking a little bit about, you know, the infrastructure that is necessary for implementing AI into the OR. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about how we can actually get this information. We can get AI into the OR and have that combined with the patient data and the human expertise to really transform the surgery and the outcome. Yeah. And the operating room is obviously, uh, you know, the place where the actual therapy happens and it's very important. But because, you know, a surgery is actually a treatment to a disease, everything that happens before and after is also extremely important. So actually the best um, integrated kind of uh, platforms allow for the connectivity between the operating room and the pre and post operative space and time and activities, right? Because you know, decisions you make right before the patient enters the operating room are extremely important about preparing the right tools, the right medications, the right people at the table. And then, of course, knowing with what level of risk that patient is exiting the OR may change the protocol of how that patient is going to be taken care of. You know, maybe that patient can go home. Maybe that patient needs to be in ICU. Maybe they need an extra dose of antibiotics because of extra bleeding, right? So first and foremost, uh, you know, truly integrated surgical decision support touches on all points of the perioperative cycle, right? You have to connect clinical and operational information that's coming directly from the workflow to really get a sense for, you know, how you can reduce this variability. And so that means that you actually have to connect a lot of different systems, right? We're talking about we did talk about the inside the OR situation where you can connect medical devices and video cameras, the real unstructured data, just like pilots or athletes use it to really understand in more granular detail how exactly that intervention is done. But it also includes, you know, the classic, uh, you know, usual suspects, the electronic medical record, because it has a trove of data about the patient and uh, his or her predispositions. The, the ERP, the operational data to understand the length of certain things, because that also can lead to important insights. So the truth of the matter is that in order to get the best, smartest insights, you have to have a full perioperative clinical and operational record with the crown jewel being the intraoperative space, because that is the most mission critical piece where things can really go wrong. And so uh, because it's real time and because it's mission critical, it has a specific, uh, you know, added level of, let's say, sophistication that's needed. And of course, it's not, in technical terms, a cloud-friendly territory, right? Like we're used to a lot of innovation being rolled out very fast using cloud technologies, and you can open your phone and you can you can use it. And even in healthcare, that's been the case, right? With, with kind of desktop usage, maybe not cell phones up until recently. In the OR, it's all on the edge, right? You cannot uh, rely on two seconds uh, upload and download from a cloud. So this edge computing, you know, the Internet of Things technology uh, toolkit is extremely important. And again, it's uh, very similar to mission use uh, critical segments outside healthcare. You know, you have to have very high uh, level of service and at the same time, it has to be a very robust and attractive from perspective of deployment and cost 
uh, solution, right? Because at the end of the day, everything that is overly expensive or unwieldy, another huge machine being rolled in into already very packed operating room is just not doesn't work, right? You know, you're expected to have ergonomics in the OR, you're expected to have plug and play capabilities, but you're expected to have a high threshold of real time, uh, high integrity flow of information. You know, so it took us at Care Syntax, for example, with the help of a few technology partners, you know, years to develop this platform uh, in a way that achieves these parameters that I just mentioned. And, you know, early adopters, of course, learned with us, you know, uh, seven, eight years ago. But at this stage, you know, we've achieved that level of quality and efficiency uh, and are able to integrate operating rooms and add the context around it to to create this proactive management of risk. And so I, I know it's possible. I think it's still sort of in the beginning in a way, right? I think the next decade will probably have every OR uh, being equipped with these kinds of systems. And in 10, in 10 years, physicians will be wondering how they were doing work without it. So given that most operating spaces or most healthcare organizations, they have these devices that don't really talk to each other or play nicely with each other. What type of investment does a hospital physician need to make to make everything plug and play, to be integrated, more interoperable, um, you know, and how can they make those investments with care syntax, ensuring that they are future proofing any investments that they do make, that they can add more capabilities, take away capabilities if they need to, they can take advantage of the the latest and greatest technology and innovations coming out without making these technological investments that are going to um, put them in a vendor lock-in or to stagnate their innovation? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, every industry has gone through like a cycle of having first a few, you know, vendors create kind of a walled garden and then gradually the users, you know, expecting more and more flexibility and, you know, open nature to be able to add value and add new applications. And I think surgery and healthcare need, needs to undergo the same change. I mean, I think the medical device world, uh, for good reasons as well, you know, has a lot of proprietary intellectual property. And so a lot of device owners and vendors are naturally quite protective of the ecosystem they create around their therapy and their device. And so historically, you know, that's been a dominant um, kind of mindset also for physicians as to, to a certain degree, align with specific vendors and think of the operating room through a prism of a device. You know, so first investment that needs to be ma made is to re reinvent and recalibrate the mindset towards the operating room being not uh, a extension of a, a leading you know, device platform, but actually a care setting that belongs to that uh, horizontal process of achieving outcome. And that you know, having infrastructure that is vendor neutral, having infrastructure that is open to capturing any kind of data and feeding any type of algorithms into it, regardless of ve what vendor you use, is of course a, a significant uh, change in, in historical patterns of acquiring these, such platforms. But, you know, from a perspective of, you know, capabilities, obviously, flexibility, but also total cost of ownership, having you know, a neutral platform that is really there to to uh, to add value regardless of what inputs it's connected to. Vendor neutrality doesn't mean any compromise in in quality uh, and safety of these platforms. So I know this is still a little bit early days, and more um, hospitals and physicians are looking to add this in the OR. So I'm curious if you have any customer examples already or any use cases of how Kerasinex really came in and helped an OR setting that you're able to share with us or, or talk a little bit about? Yeah, no, I mean, I think there are multiple examples. I think, um, you know, the ones that I'm really excited about are the ones that were able to achieve things at scale. You know, so we have an example of a medical insurance company, actually, that insure, insures uh, surgical risk in terms of medical malpractice and sort of safety aspects, um, partner with us to create proactive risk management solutions that are using, you know, some of the understanding of safety that they have and processes and governance with our technology 
creating a proactive risk management offering that both in the OR and in terms of governance is fostering this you know culture of improvement and safety using the data feeds from our platform. Um, and you know this partnership has been very successful um, in in Europe, actually in, in multiple countries in hundreds of operating rooms, basically convincing the hospitals that the combination of technology, and uh, you know, good governance of uh, how to achieve you know a high reliability organization. If you combine this into one solution set, it's in their it's in their best interest. And we've had a lot of positive traction and a lot of indications of actual improvement in technical skills of physicians, uh, improvement in outcomes, improvement in managing surgical site infections. So I think that's kind of a, a more complex partnership. Um, Example, but of course, there are numerous uh, end users that have seen the same, right? We've published several studies with surgeons, I think from 20 different countries about how usage of um, intraoperative data, including video, can improve technical skills of physicians, which is one of the biggest determinants of success, right? At the end of the day, you may have a very sophisticated robotic assistant or a gamma knife, but at the end of the day, it's still the skill set many times that decides whether it's an excellent or an average outcome. And so we've been able to show that, um, you know, using these advanced platforms in the OR can lift that performance level. Um, and uh, it's not only surgeons, it's also uh, other uh, physicians and clinical uh, collaborators. So for example, nursing, right? We're increasingly starting to deploy um, almost like interactive step-by-step -step navigation guides in the OR, you know, after the pandemic, a lot of folks uh, entered the workforce without maybe as much training as they would have beforehand. So there's, there's, there are a lot of new, for example, nurses who very quickly need to catch up uh, in the environment where there's a lot of new volume because so many surgeries came back after the pandemic. So being able to quickly ramp up and actually get the step-by-step -step and move-by-move -move support in the right moment of the procedure is extremely helpful for somebody who is still lacking confidence and the experience to, to know what to do ne next, right? You mentioned a lot of different technologies that go into this. So I want imagine there's a technological partnership that goes into this. You know, I, I should mention that the IoT chat and inside.tech as a whole, we are sponsored by Intel, but I can see you're using the edge, you're using the AI. So I can see there's there's probably some Intel hardware and Intel software that goes into this. And there's a lot of different moving pieces to make this happen. So I'm curious, what's the value of working with partners like Intel to make this a reality, to bring this to ORs in a safe, secure and accurate way? Yeah, no, and even though it's sponsored, I can I can kind of rave about some of the support we've been getting here because at the end of the day, you know, being a surgery specialist, we have a very good view for what the end application and use case should be, uh, but we don't have as much experience building that infrastructure, and we don't have the benchmarks and comparables from other use cases that may be similar in terms of the rigor and in terms of the actual in architecture. So, you know, Intel is indeed a, an important partner that helped us and is helping us to to meet those criteria that I described, right? I mean, uh, having an integrated smart surgery platform that is sort of plug and play, <laughs> that is, you know, very smart and not very heavy in terms of hardware content, uh, something that is able to generate information, but also have the capability and the bandwidth to receive algorithm and actually produce AI and showcase it real time. You know, it's a pretty sophisticated set of requirements. And, uh, you know, Intel has been one of the partners who have really uh, plugged in with us almost in, inside our team to to make this happen, right? So being able to design the architecture, find the right components, utilize some of their components that they develop, like OpenVINO, which allows for this AI uh, penetration and um, uh, usage. All of these uh, were very important. Uh, I think without a partner like Intel, you know, we would have been at the least much slower, uh, looking for every piece ourselves, probably making more mistakes. In the end, I think, you know, if you really think about the speed at which we've created some new, very key new generation components together, I think it's probably, 
you know, half or, 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 uh, or even less than if we would have tried to embark on this ourselves. But uh, we're excited to, to be working with them. And I think, you know, there's going to be continued innovation. And alongside Intel, of course, we also work uh, with cloud solution providers, you know, AWS and Google Cloud. Because at the end of the day, you kind of have to have um, an edge to cloud transition. As I mentioned, it's it's a pre-operative, intraoperative, and post-operative space. So if you really wanted to have an integrated, you know, performance or decision support system, you continuously have to go to the edge and back to the cloud and make the information interchangeable. And so um, it's been very rewarding as well to, to kind of build with our partners because actually all, all they collaborate in between themselves, you know, Intel and Google, Intel and AWS. So there's a lot of uh, big technology um, uh, company support here to enable this. And then some of the secret sauce and the knowledge of what really makes it different for the users that, that we bring to the table. Yeah, it's great to see all the, the different partnerships happening because it's not that you have to solve this alone, especially in a sensitive environment, like surgical environment that you're working in. It's it's good to see that you're using the expertise and the knowledge that you have as a company, but then also leveraging support and expertise and technology from, from other companies as well to really make this as high quality and as possible as can be. Of course, the pandemic has been an impediment to any innovation, given the you know distraction on on real, you know, existential slash you know day to day issues. But that's subsided, and I think everybody's really looking at surgery and saying, okay, well, it's very important. Uh, you cannot prevent surgery many uh, very often, and yet it's still not as safe as it could be. It's not as safe as flying. It's not as safe as even some other medical procedures. You know, it's time to improve it. It's time to to you know let uh, let everybody um, you know change certain ways of doing things. And to your point about partnership, it takes an ecosystem of players to achieve that. And I think we're we're shaping that. And Intel is one of the partners we are extremely grateful to have alongside us. Absolutely, I can't wait to see how else this space continues to grow, and where else that that partnership with Intel and and other partners you're working with will you know bring these technologies, make this more mainstream, and see that adoption over the next couple of years. And I can, like you said, physicians in the future are going to say, "I can't believe that we were working without this." And I think patients are even going to say, "I can't believe I had gotten surgery back in the day without all of this information at the physician's fingertips." So it's great to see all these transformations and innovations happening. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. But before we go, Dennis. Um, you know, this has been a wealth of knowledge in this conversation. Is there anything you want to leave our our listeners with? Any final thoughts or key takeaways? Well, I mean, I think um, I just want uh, the ecosystem to kind of acknowledge a couple of things, right? I mean, I very often see that folks, and I think there are reasons for that, think of surgery as something that's been figured out, um, something that's reached maturity and doesn't require innovation. It doesn't give me any pleasure to say that this is not the case. I think 15% complication rates, mortality rates, going in a procedure not knowing how it's going to turn out is still a daily occurrence. Um, and yet, you know, it's a stark size uh, that surgery has in terms of like a share of volume in, in treatments, right? Next to pharmaceutical therapies, surgical therapies are the, the second most used way of correcting a disease, right? It's, if you think about spend, I think it's over 20, 30% of all of healthcare spend in the US is connected to surgery. And so if you think about, you know, the variability and the risk that's still in the system, and you also even convert this to, 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 uh, to spend, uh, you know, this is a huge problem that has clinical implication, it has cost implications for our society, for the, for the government who is insuring a lot of people. Um, so it hasn't been fully solved, right? It hasn't been fully solved and it has opportunity and room to get to the same place as we have gone with aviation, you know? Uh, I don't think you and I would accept getting on the plane with a 15% chance of something going wrong in that flight. I think, <laughs> I think we, should, we should have that feeling going in surgery that everything is going to be okay, um, backed by real 
statistics. And in order to change the statistics, you have to let all boats rise. And in order to do that, you have to deploy these kinds of solutions into your workflow. And, you know, together, you know, with the ecosystem of providers, insurers, technology vendors, you really can make surgery safer and smarter. And it will have broad impact on patient health, millions of cases, and it'll have broad impact on on cost as well. So I think um, my message is, you know, please think about surgery as part of uh, part of innovation where faster, better cures to certain diseases can be achieved. And, uh, you know, uh, there are ample uh, room for improvement in, in every provider organization uh, as long as the mindset is there. And we're always happy to be there together with our partners to help, you know, move forward towards that objective. When you think about all the, the risks and the complications that can happen in surgery and then all the benefits that patients and physicians get by having this data, having AI assistance in the operating room and at their fingertips, it, it seems like a no-brainer to, to do some of this stuff. So I'm excited to see how else this space moves forward. I invite all our listeners to visit the Keras and Next um, Syntax website to see how else you guys are going to continue to inv- innovate or how they can partner with you to add some of these technologies into their operating room. And I just want to thank you again for the insightful conversation, Dennis. Thank you for joining us on the IoT Chat. And thanks to our listeners for listening and tuning in today. Until next time, this has been the IoT Chat.